Now, I don't know what you young folks uh, uh, that uh, listen to the country radio station, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what you're thinking, but what you're listening to, that ain't country music. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it might sound cool and sound twangy, but when you talk about country music, you know, we got to go back to the classics. We're talking Waylon and Willie and, you know, all these kind of guys. And, oh, hey, yes, thank you. I got a witness there. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, I can remember the first time that I, that I was introduced to what they call classic country music. It was a Pepsi commercial from the 1998 Super Bowl uh, in which the audience has a view of watching a Coke delivery driver uh, stocking a, a Coke refrigerator. And uh, he gets done with his, uh, you know, stocking the Coke and he gets his box all closed up, and as he's walking back to his truck, he passes by a Pepsi cooler, and he looks around to make sure that no one's watching him, and he opens it up. You all remember this commercial? And he grabs a Pepsi can out of it, and every shelf comes crashing down, and literally hundreds of Pepsi cans come rolling into the aisle, and everybody in the store comes running by, and they see this Coke delivery guy with a Pepsi in his hand, and disaster all around him. And he, he puts it back and casually walks away. It was a hit. And it would have been if it was a silent commercial that only had the loud sound of all these cans just coming crashing down. But... Uh, Pepsi had the genius idea of putting the soundtrack of Hank Williams' Your Cheatin' Heart over the top of it. Uh, it's a song all about how your cheatin' heart will find you out. It will tell your secrets. And the Pepsi company uh, wanted to convince America that even Coke representatives have a secret love affair with Pepsi. I think Pepsi's wrong, by the way. It's all just nice advertising. But uh, they want people to think that even a guy who is committed to the Coke brand have a secret love affair with, Pe with Pepsi and that the truth will eventually come crashing down and spilling out for everyone to see. Uh, you know, Hank Williams was on to something. Uh, it's the principle that sin might be initially fun. Uh, it might uh, be thrilling. It might be uh, enjoyable for a season, but as the days and the weeks and the months and the years of hiding and secrecy will uh, go on and on, uh, eventually it will catch up to us. Uh, our cheating hearts, as, as Hank Williams sang, will, will make us weep, will cry and cry and try to sleep, but sleep won't come the whole night through because our cheating heart uh, will, will tell on you, but it will tell on us. You know, we're very near at the end of the, the book of 1 Samuel. And as we turn to, page, uh, to chapter 28, uh, the focus returns now to King Saul, uh, who finds himself in a desperate situation without God and without hope. He is looking in every which way in order to, to be able to connect with God. Um, but yet, he can't find answers and relief. He is only met with silence, and he's only met with terror. And what we're going to find out is that this is, uh, uh, this is the result of years of rejecting the Lord. This is the result of rejecting the Lord's word and his commands and his grace and instead embracing the God that Saul sees in, in the mirror. All of this while at the same time he puts on this facade of faithfulness. His, his cheating heart has told on him. His sins have, have come back to haunt him. And if there was a banner that we could put over this entire chapter uh, that highlights the most important thing that we need to know, uh, it would be this. And it's short and it's memorable and you can leave here uh, remembering this, that we must trust in God alone with no supplements, no additives. That one thing will save you a lot of pain but it's not that easy. So let's look at some practical ways in which we can cultivate a dependent trust on God alone. The first is that we ought to seek the Lord alone and wait on him. We should seek the Lord alone and wait on him. Starting in verse 3, the author gives us really two pieces of information that are quite crucial for us to understand the thrust of this chapter and where it, it's uh, going. First, uh, in verse 3, it says that Samuel was dead. Uh, th this isn't new news. We learned this all the way back in chapter 25. 
Uh, though it was just in passing, his burial, his, his death, his burial, they're, they're covered in a single verse, but in case we missed it, the author reminds us of, uh, of this because it's going to be crucial uh, to understand what's happening here. Samuel's being dead is an important detail to keep in mind here as we go forward. Uh, second, it says that Saul had put all the mediums and all the necromancers and, and fortune tellers and palm readers and whatever, out of the land. It was probably one of the only ways that, that Saul actually obeyed the Lord because we see many times throughout Deuteronomy and Leviticus that God says, don't, don't visit these mediums. Don't do this kind of thing. This is not good. And uh, if you do, uh, the Israelites were to be put out of the camp or out of, out of the land of Israel. And if there were Israelites that were practicing these things, the, it was punishable uh, by death. And so to keep these two, we need to keep these two things in mind as we continue. Now look at verse 4. The Philistines assembled and came and, came and encamped at, Shun, at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. So the Philistines now are right on the border of, uh, between uh, Philistia and Israel, and King Achish of, of Gath, uh, whom David is with, if you remember. He is, he's currently a servant of, uh, of Achish. He had ga- uh, garnered a large army that would more than likely divide and, and conquer. And from where Saul sits, uh, which is just south of Shunem here in Gilboa, uh, he really is, militarily speaking, he's a sitting duck. Uh, This is not a battle that he uh, can win without divine intervention. And so in verse 5, it it makes sense. It says that when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And, uh, uh, but the thing that we need to recall is that when we're in desperate times and we're scared and when we're we're lonely, what is it that we're we're supposed to do? Remember Psalm 56, verse 3, that when I am afraid, I, I will put my trust in you and God, whose word I praise and God who I trust. What can mortal flesh do to me? But instead of resting on the goodness and and the faithfulness and the mercy and the grace of of God, Saul instead turns to superstitious activities, hoping to find God in them. Look in verse 6. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. Now push pause. It's not as if he's gone into his prayer closet and, and had a moment with God just those two together, but it shows what were the means by which he tried to hear from God. Saul inquired of the Lord. The Lord did not answer him either by dreams or urim or by prophets. So instead of humbling himself and seeking the face of God one-on-one in in which God has, has called us to, he turns to dream interpretation, which wasn't odd in a Jewish context, but nowhere in Scripture are they told, or we told, to interpret dreams. But what about the Urim? Remember that the, the, the Urim was a stone that was in the middle of the high priest's uh, chest plate around all of the stones that represented the, uh, the tribes of Israel. And it was the stone by which the priest was to connect with God in order to intercede on Israel's behalf and to hear from God. But Saul could not use a Urim. Why? Because he had killed all the priests at Nob. And the one that got away brought the Urim to David. So right now, David is in the presence of this this stone. Well, what about the prophets? Well, as far as we know, Samuel was the only reliable prophet, and guess what we just learned about him? He's dead. He's not around. So if dreams and Urim and the prophets aren't available, what's the next thing that Saul can think of that is spiritual? Well, How about the mediums? Those who claim to connect with the spirit world. Verse 7, Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. Now did you get the the peak of the folly and foolishness that, uh, that Saul is displaying here? Who is he supposed to inquire of? God, right? Who does he actually go to? A witch. 
You know, we, we might not be consulting fortune tellers, tarot card readers, or palm readers, or psychics, or horoscopes, or Ouija boards, or, 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 or whatever. And, and, if, and if you are, that practice needs to stop now, and it needs to get, it needs to get put away. But we shouldn't think that we are all that different than Saul. The minute we start looking for signs and wonders, or if we think that there's a special place that we can go where God's Spirit will be more readily active, or if we rely on behaviors and beliefs that give us a false sense of control over over a situation, or if we use good luck charms to relieve us of the burden of true, relief, of true belief, when we use prayer beads or prayer shawls or rosaries and, and like things, or using words repetitively like a pagan mantra more than a heartfelt seeking of the Lord alone, then we are just as superstitious of uh, spiritual things as Saul. At college, I worked at a Christian bookstore. It was one of my favorite jobs. But one thing that I found that was really odd was that one item we constantly sold out of and had to continue ordering again and again was something called a St. Joseph statue. Now, a St. Joseph statue would be used if you would go ahead and buy it, and if you were wanting to sell your house and were having a tough time doing so, you could get one of these St. Joseph statues, dig a hole in your yard, put him upside down, fill the hole, and put your for sale sign next to that hole there. Then St. Joseph would come along and help you sell your house. I'm not kidding. Look it up. You can get them on Amazon right now. Catholics, Lutherans, it didn't matter. They sold out all the time. But, folks, all of us have superstitious things that we need to rid out of our lives. Uh, the, the, the thing that we need to realize is that there's a reason why God gave us the second commandment. We're not to bow down to other things and to worship them. We're to worship the Lord and him alone. We don't need supplements or additives in order to hear from him, to reach him, or have him act on our behalf. So in verse 8 now, Saul has disguised himself and he's put on other garments and and went and he and two men with him and they came to uh, the woman by night. And the fact that he has changed his clothes is not insignificant here. This is an important detail. We've talked a lot in 1 Samuel about the importance of the royal garb. It is an identifiable mark of who is in charge. Throughout the book, we've seen that taking off robe, the royal robe is symbolic of shedding themselves from a royal position. And the deeper and deeper that Saul gets entrenched in his sin and his disbelief, the farther he gets from being God's anointed uh, king. And he strips himself here of his royal identification, and he goes by the cover of darkness, which is odd in itself since Endor is now actually behind enemy lines. It's actually behind the Philistine camp to do that which is forbidden. And notice it's all in the name of the Lord. Verse 8, divine for me a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, well surely you know what Saul has done, how he's cut off the mediums and the necromancers of the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? Translation, mediums? What mediums? I don't see any mediums here. There's no mediums. She's afraid. She doesn't know if this is a trap, but notice how Saul comforts her in verse 10. But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. He justifies his sin in the name of the Lord. And we see this all the time in mainline liberal churches today, going and calling up God's name and the Lord to bless and celebrate things that God absolutely abhors. I read an article uh, just this past week about how the national ELCA, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America's national magazine, had a large article that was written up praising one of their pastors down in the South who decided to walk in a gay pride parade totally naked. I shouldn't say she was totally naked. She was wearing a cleric with a rainbow cape. 
And this was something that they are celebrating as blessed by God and good. But how often do we also minimize or justify our sin or by claiming that God's word doesn't apply to our situation or thinking that it's fine to do whatever it is I'm planning to do because, hey, God is forgiving and I can do this and I can be free because I know that even if I do it, God, God's a good God. We are in so many ways guilty of saying, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon me for this thing. Verse 11. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring me Samuel. Bring, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. I think the King James Version says, She freaked out. And she's probably freaking out here because she's not a real medium. The, the, the dark arts are filled with charlatans who prey upon the weakness of, of, uh, of people. Uh, it's not legal anymore, but back when I was a kid, I remember so many commercials during daytime television where there were psychics on there that, you know, Miss Cleo and uh, Latoya Jackson uh, telling you, hey, if you just call me uh, for $5 a minute, I can take 20 minutes to tell you your fortune. And so it was just this act of getting more money and more money. There was a show a number of years ago called Crossing Over with John Edwards who claimed that he was a medium and he would go into large groups like this and he would say something random that if I were to say, hey, I'm hearing from a spirit that, uh, that owned a cat, well, of course that's going to apply to someone in this, this room, right? They're all charlatans. There was... I brought up a clip the other day on this John Edwards thing, and he was interviewing one of these guys from the Backstreet Boys. And he said, hey, uh, I have a relative coming through that, that uh, they're saying something about alligators. Do you know anything about alligators? You've been wrestling with alligators? He says, well, I'm afraid of frogs. And he said, well, that must be it. It's, <laughs> this, it's nothing but a show. But here, maybe for the first time, this medium actually connects and the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? He can't see what this is. And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, what? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. How did Saul know that it was Samuel? It was by the robe. It's this very robe that, that Saul grabbed and was torn as Samuel walked away. And Samuel said, just as my robe is torn, so God is going to tear your kingdom from you, Saul. He knew the identity of this apparition. Now, at the end of verse 14, we find the end of Saul and his idolatry. And he bowed down with his face to the ground and he paid homage. He thinks that he's found relief. But what he's actually done is bowed down one last time to anything but the Lord. He again has broken the second commandment. He has, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling birds and man and animals and, and creeping things. And unless we seek the Lord alone, we will join Saul in debased worship. So what should we do? What do we do when we face a desperate situation and we hear the silence of God? Well, he's not answering us. Our situation is not getting any better. We do exactly the psalm that we read here a few minutes ago, Psalm 13, which says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Have you ever felt like that before? Man, you're, you're, you're seeking God, and it's just like you're talking to a wall. I mean, God's not gone. His, his, his felt presence might be gone, but he, God is right there. But it's as if he's silent. But what does David, interestingly enough, say is the solution? Well, we find the solution in verse 5 when he says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. 
So what are we supposed to do when we don't hear from God? We trust, we rejoice, we sing, we remember. And if we wrap all of that up in a, in a package, in essence, we worship God. We worship God in the silence, and we do what Psalm 130 tells us to do, is that we wait for him. We worship in the pain and the silence, and we wait for the salvation of the Lord. Second, we must trust and obey God's word alone. We should trust and obey God's word alone. One of the challenges of this text is to not get bogged down with the weirdness of it. This is a weird chapter. We don't see anything like this really anywhere else in the Bible. And commentators have spilled a lot of ink on whether or not this is actually Samuel that's coming up or whether or not this is some demonic apparition. Uh, It seems to me that this is really Samuel. Now, we don't need to go beyond that. We shouldn't form a theology of the afterlife based on this. We shouldn't get any insight onto uh, mediums or whatever. But for whatever reason, God allowed Samuel to show up here. And the most important thing is the dialogue. Look at verse 15. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by the prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. What a sad state of being that Saul is in here. He has exhausted all of his resources. God is even ignoring him. And if Samuel can't come to his aid, then he is utterly hopeless. John Woodhouse, in his excellent commentary on uh, Samuel, says this, and I'll have it on the screen. Utter hopelessness is the darkest of all human experiences. It is the realization that there is absolutely no prospect of a future with anything positive in it. Hopelessness, when it overcomes a person, strips away motivation or enthusiasm for living because there is nothing, absolutely nothing good to look forward to. When fear, even fear is better than hopelessness. When we are afraid, we usually dread something that could happen or that may be as bad as we imagine, but there's usually also the possibility that things will turn out better than we expected. There is, in other words, hope. Hopelessness, then, is the experience of believing there is no future worth having. That's where Saul is. He is in the cusp of psychological and eternal hell. And it's all because of his own doing. Samuel explains in verse 16, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, For the Lord has torn the kingdom, there's that term, out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. So God has not only given Saul the cold shoulder, but Samuel says that God has even become his enemy. What a pitiful state. But this is the state of everyone who is not in Christ Jesus. Unlike Saul, however, most unbelievers, they don't feel the weight of being at odds with God. Everything is just just fine. They have been numbed by their sin. And Saul, for a certain extent, has too, since comfort is more important to him right now than redemption. So the question is, why are Saul and God enemies? And the reason is something that we ought to pay attention to. Look in verse 18. It says, Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. So he's reminding Saul now of events that happened all the way back in chapter 15 when uh, God plainly told Saul that he was to go to the Amalekites and completely wipe them out. Men, women, children, agriculture, everything 
for what they did to the Israelites all the way back in the, the book of, of Deuteronomy and Joshua. The word of the Lord was clear, but yet Saul found his own counsel to be better than the Lord's. He spared the best of the flock. He spared the king, Agag, at that point, and kept him as a POW. That was the initial sin, but it didn't stop from there. From there, he would go to offer a sacrifice to the Lord on his own because he couldn't wait five more minutes for Samuel to show up. From there, he would go on to kill 80 priests at Nob. And now, where is he? He's in a medium's tent. Saul's sin is caught up to him simply because he didn't listen to God's word, because he didn't see it as trustworthy, and he didn't recognize it as binding and authoritative. Instead, he liked the voice of the serpent better that says, did God really say such and such? Now, how often do we substitute the clear word of God for our own preference? In my experience in ministry, we'll, as, we'll ascribe to the authority of the Bible, we'll love the preaching of God's word until it has something to do with us. And when it hits home, it's not convicting to lead us to Christ. Rather, it's meddling. Adultery is a sin until we find ourselves entrenched in it. Then the clear word of God doesn't apply to us. I know that the Bible says... X, Y, and Z isn't, uh, isn't right, but uh, that's, does that really mean what the Bible says? You might say, hey, I, I, I know that the Bible is clear that men should lead in the home and in the church, but it doesn't really say that. What it really says is that men shouldn't lead in the home and in the church. This is God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 tell us that all Scripture, and that should be highlighted, it should be italicized, it should be circled, all those things, all Scripture is breathed out from God. It comes from God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be equipped for every good work. Now, either that verse is true or it isn't. And we're not at liberty to pick and choose which ones we like and which ones we don't, which ones we will apply and which ones uh, we won't. We have to remember that the Bible is not meant to be interpreted by us. We are to be interpreted by the Bible. We are not to master the text. The text is to master us. We've got it all wrong. And Saul is the perfect example of what happens when we choose our will or the culture's direction over God's word. We need to trust and obey in God's word alone. Third and finally, we should turn to Christ while there is still time. We should turn to Christ while there is still time. This is a, a tough uh, text to wrestle with uh, because the final verses confront us with the notion that none of us want to face, none of us like facing us. Uh, we don't like to face it. And that is that our time is short. We don't have many days here. Many of us have already lived the majority of our lives. Many of us have, if the Lord wills, many more years to come. But the reality is that none of us knows how much longer we have left here. You have no guarantee that you're even going to make it home from church today. You may feel perfectly healthy right now. You may feel in the prime of your life. But I've been in the ministry long enough to have known people who have felt great one day and they go to the doctor the next, they get a diagnosis and they're gone within six months. It happens. I don't say that to scare you or manipulate you. I'm simply pointing out the reality that life is fragile and it's very short. You have one crack and it's over. And there are no redos. 
We have no control over it, but what we do have control over is the decisions that we make in that time that we have. And if there's anything that these verses, uh, last seven verses tell us, it is this. Turn to Christ while you still have breath and a beating heart. In verse 19, Samuel continues to address Saul. He says, Moreover, the Lord will give Israel uh, also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Now this sounds eerily similar to chapter 2 when the prophet went up to uh, the priest Eli and told him, Hey, by this time tomorrow both your sons and you are going to be dead. And it came to pass. Saul has become the embodiment of Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 10, verses 27 and following, where it says, If we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. We looked at that verse a few weeks ago. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the story of all who have heard the word of God's grace in Christ Jesus, but choose to follow their own heart. Or the persuasion of the culture. The best thing that Saul could have done was to come to his senses, recognize his grieving of the Holy Spirit, and repent and turn sincerely to God. But for Saul, it was too late. He was too in- entrenched. He was too in love with himself and his own way. God had, as Paul said in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, uh, and since he did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave him up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. It was too late. So what did he do instead? He despaired. Verse 20, Saul fell at once full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. There was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. What a sad and pitiable thing it is to know at the end of your days that you have wasted your life. The end result of living for yourself is regret Sadness, fear, and hopelessness. And what a heartbreaking end for someone who could not get over the addiction to himself. He could have ended in glory, but instead, his last enjoyment in life was a meal prepared by a witch. And instead of a life of faithful obedience, he is summoned to obey her. It says in verse 21, the woman came to Saul When she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to you and what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I I won't eat. But his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he listened to their words. So he arose from the earth, sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fattened calf in the house. And she quickly killed it, and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread out of it, and she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate, and they rose and went on their way. It's a meal fit for a king, served by a medium, all in preparation for the day of death that would come sooner than Saul would have wanted. So what are we to take from this? How do we move on from such a dreadful scene to something that is far more wonderful for you and I? I think the first thing is is that we need to be uh, sober about our feebleness and our inability. We're not any better than Saul. 
We're on the same level that he is. And our time can come just as quickly. But second, it's to realize that Saul's end does not have to be our end. We don't have to die in our sins. And we don't have to drink the cup of God's wrath for our, our sin because there is one that has already done that on our behalf. We're at an advantage to Saul because no one was willing to step in on his behalf and for him. But we have one in every way who has stepped in and taken our place. He has taken our place in the life that we could not live. He lived morally perfect. He never had a bad thought, word, or deed. He has taken our place by absorbing the wrath of God for the sins that we deserved in his body on the cross. He has taken our place in his resurrection by rising from the dead, giving us hope that this is not all that there is. So when Saul heard the words of Samuel, tomorrow you and your son shall be with me, he was rightly terrified. But we ought not to be terrified because when Jesus breathed his last, he looked to his left at a sinner just like you and me and said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, Hank Williams was not wrong. Your cheating heart will tell on you. You'll cry and cry and try to sleep. Sleep won't come the whole night through. Your cheating heart will tell on you unless you first tell on it. Go to Christ today with your sins and your sorrows. Turn from them and turn to him in faith. If or when you do, you will never have to live in despair and hopelessness. Because regardless of how many days that you have left, Jesus right now is busy preparing a place for you. And if he is gone and prepared a place for you, he will come again and take you to where he is so that where he is, you will also be. Friends, there is hope in Christ. Go to him. Father, I thank you.